Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining CAR and our panel for the second installment of our HIV and COVID webinar. CAR has uh, elected to address the current crisis with COVID uh, and our concerns in the HIV population by conducting this series of uh, webinar sessions. Um, so I'd like to thank the team at CAR, and I'd also like to, to thank Gilead for their support of this webinar. Remember that this session is clinically focused. We may touch on many other aspects, but ultimately it's the uh, clinically relevant uh, information that we're hoping to cover in this session. I'm Curtis Cooper. I'm a, an infectious disease specialist uh, with the Ottawa Immunodeficiency Clinic at the Ottawa Hospital. And it's good to see everyone again. I'd like to take an opportunity to uh, introduce each of our panelists today, starting with uh, Dr. Marissa Becker. Thanks, Curtis, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, my name's Marissa Becker. I'm an infectious disease physician and associate professor at the University of Manitoba and the associate director of the Manitoba HIV program. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Shara Cater. Thanks, Curtis. Uh, so my name is Shara Cater. I'm a professor of medicine at McMaster University in Hamilton. I'm an infectious disease specialist and the medical director of the HIV clinic uh, in Hamilton. Thank you. And from Dr. Daryl Tan. Great, thanks. Thanks, Curtis. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Daryl Tan, I'm in, and uh, I'm an infectious diseases physician at St. Michael's Hospital and a clinician scientist there. I'm also an associate professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. And finally, one of my longtime colleagues and collaborators, uh, Pierre Jaguer. Thank you, Curtis. I'm uh, Pierre Jaguer. I'm the uh, uh, clinical pharmacist working at the uh, HIV clinic at the Ottawa Hospital. Great. So thank you uh, to each of you for joining this webinar and uh, really looking forward to benefiting from the great amount of expertise that I know that each of you bring to this. So without any further delay, we will start uh, the questions. We've developed a list of important topics and questions that we think are of interest to you, the, uh, the viewer. And we'll start uh, with question number one, which uh, we'll direct to uh, Daryl. And a uh, simple question, what do the numbers look like in Canada with regards to COVID? Sure, so th the numbers in Canada specifically at this point uh, remain uh, pretty staggering if you think about it. We had our very first case reported of COVID-19 uh, reported in the city that I uh, live and work in Toronto in just January of this year. And within a few short months, half a year, we've got more than 120,000 uh, confirmed cases or so across the country. Uh, and amongst that, uh, already seen 9,000 deaths. Now, this is of course just a fraction of what we're seeing globally. You know, the WHO has reported close to 20 million confirmed COVID cases in that time period with uh, over 700,000 deaths uh, as of uh, yesterday. So the numbers are, are really quite staggering uh, when you think about it. Um, and I think they're even more staggering when we think about the limitations of those numbers that, that we just uh, mentioned. So those are confirmed cases. Uh, and that's, uh, it's very important to distinguish that from what we think would be the estimated true number of infections uh, that have occurred around the world, uh, because these confirmed cases are really based on the presence of a positive diagnostic test, typically a PCR or an RT-PCR test taken from a nasal swab or some other respiratory specimen from somebody. And we know that many, many people uh, go uh, undetected. In other words, we know that there's a lot of asymptomatic individuals uh, who would never have gotten tested, other people who were symptomatic and were even early in the epidemic told not to get tested for very good reason at the time because of wanting to preserve our, our testing resources. So uh, we know that those confirmed numbers are a gross underestimate of the true number of, of uh, cases that we've seen. So in order to get around that, uh, public health authorities have uh, and researchers have tried to get a, get a sense of what the true number of, of cases would have been. Uh, the best way to do that at this point is to do ser sero surveillance studies or serologic uh, studies in which you uh, measure antibody levels in a whole bunch of people. And at this point in Canada, we have um, Canada's own COVID-19 Immunity Task Force, which has 
started to generate data that, that looks at that very question. Uh, their most recent estimate from about 10,000 blood samples that were collected in conjunction with the Canadian Blood Services estimates that less than 1% of Canadians uh, have uh, positive uh, antibody tests for COVID-19 at this, at this point. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's still, you know, a, a very uncommon phenomenon that we've seen in our country. Uh, but uh, we know from other zero surveillance studies that have been done in other parts of the world that the prevalence is often five to time to 10 times higher than what the confirmed case counts show. So all that to say uh, that we've seen a staggering number of cases. Uh, the confirmed case count is an underestimate of the true number of infections. Um, and uh, ultimately, we're hoping for a lot more granularity, a, a lot more data to continue to, to come out. Uh, we know, of course, that the distribution of infections is not uh, homogenous across different populations or across uh, this huge country that we live in. Um, and so we look forward to more data uh, at this time. But uh, what we know is that it's been very common. Uh, many people have, have died, um, but the vast, vast majority of us remain susceptible. Great. Thanks, Daryl. Sherrick. Um, every every night when I get home and listen to the news, it sounds like a disaster. There's another story about another outbreak somewhere in Canada. We know that there's horrible issues in uh, in places like the U.S. in Brazil. Um, are we winning the battle in Canada, or what? What are your thoughts? Uh, well, thanks, Curtis. Uh, well, I'm going to follow up on, on Daryl's comments, and I think um, it's, it's absolutely a key point that whatever data we have is likely an estimation at this stage. And uh, having said that, I think it depends whether you look at the glass as being half full or half empty. So from the perspective of Canada, as Daryl indicated himself, we're talking you know, about 120,000 confirmed cases. So really, from a global perspective, one would make the argument that we're doing fairly well compared to the global pandemic that we're dealing with. Um, also share with you the fact that we're a large country, so there is significant variation across Canada. I think about a week ago, if you went to the public health um, website and took a look at the Canadian distribution, um, you would actually see what looks like promising data that about a week ago, there were, um, I think, under five, there were five provinces that had reported no new cases. There were 10 provinces that had reported no new deaths. Uh, so that's all very positive news. Uh, that doesn't mean that we need to let our guards down. It does not mean that we need to stop the public health measures that, that have clearly have helped us get to where we are today. Um, Ontario and Quebec uh, clearly carry the larger burden of the Canadian numbers. I think somewhere around, uh, you know, estimating somewhere around 100,000 of those 120,000 cases sit between Ontario and Quebec. Um, Alberta follows as I think the third most common province. Uh, so I think we can take some uh, sense of, of reassurance from the successes we've had in Canada. But as you've indicated, uh, I work in Hamilton. Uh, within 40 kilometers of the city that I'm in, there's a neighboring city, uh, St. Catharines, which has significantly larger numbers. So the work isn't done. There are pockets of outbreaks. Uh, we need to be vigilant. But I think we can take some solace that certainly from a Canadian national perspective in the context of the global pandemic, I think we are certainly ahead. Good. Thanks, Eric. Marissa, well, what could we be doing better as a country? Thanks, Curtis. Um, so I think as, as Daryl sort of nicely shared with, uh, in terms of what's happening with the numbers and, and Sherrick just talked about, we've, we've done well in some regards, but I think certainly there are areas that we need to be doing more of and, and better at. And uh, I think, you know, one of the challenges from the start in Canada we've faced have been uh, numbers in our personal care homes. And I think it's been quite unfortunate from the start. And I think we've, we've, we're learning, um, but we've maybe learned too slowly or made changes too slowly. But hopefully with what we've learned, we'll be better placed going forward. I think some of the long-term care facilities weren't prepared early on in terms of training, PPE and prevention strategies and testing. But again, as I noted, hopefully going forward, uh, those facilities are now going to be better prepared to, to make sure that their residents are, are protected. I think the other area that maybe we're not winning in is, is around masks. And I think globally, the messaging around masks hasn't been clear. And I think that's been the same in Canada. We know that masks, if worn consistently by all, and particularly in, in indoor settings where we can't physically distance, can be effective. Uh, you know, I wear mine to protect you, you wear your mask to protect me. And, and if I think there's more messaging around that and we can pick that up, that, that'll really help with what's happening. 
The other area, I think Daryl touched on this when he talked about some of the um, heterogeneity is that, and the need for, for really good data is that if we can have more data to inform sort of more micro level planning and, and our responses, we'll be able to more effectively respond to some of the heterogeneity in, in the epidemic and to be able to meet the needs, um, you know, across the different um, cities and towns and, and, and provinces across the country. In terms of uh, sort of globally, I think as, as you've talked about and others, there, there are definitely um, countries that are continuing to see really rising instances and, and, and emphasis obviously there in terms of the importance of those places in the global pandemic. And then I think for HIV and COVID, 2020, as this audience is familiar, was really the year that was set for the 90-90-90 targets. And UNAIDS just released their reports, and it shows that only a few countries are going to hit the targets, and most are going to miss them quite significantly. And there are growing reports that COVID and the response to COVID have really led to disruptions in HIV services globally, further deviating us, I think, from those targets. Now, I'm not sure that the, we're seeing the same level of disruption here in Canada, but certainly individuals at higher risk of HIV and those that are more vulnerable are going to be more heavily impacted by the pandemic and the response to the pandemic. Really important points. Thanks, Marissa. Again, for all of us who tune into the news every day, there seems to be a different medication that's going to solve all of our problems. And many of these have fallen right off the map. So Pierre, I'm wondering if you can help us uh, sort through the morass of options out there and talk a little bit about uh, some of the key medications that we should be looking at going forward in providing care for people suffering with COVID infection. Thank you, Curtis. I think at the last webinar, there was a lot of noise around hydroxychloroquine about Kelitra. Uh, we've, we've heard quite a lot uh, on, on these uh, two uh, treatment regimens um, to the point where WHO has decided to stop uh, enrolling patients uh, uh, with these regimens uh, in, in their studies. Uh, so there's been quite a few publications that failed to show um, clinical benefits of hydroxychloroquine plus or minus azithromycin. Uh, same thing a bit for Kelitra, so there, we hear a little less about that. Um, I know that there's still clinical research uh, ongoing, uh, of trying to understand what is the real place of these agents. Uh, it, it maybe has to do with um, the, the stage of, of the disease by itself, and when do we use them, and uh, so, so, so I think the jury is not yet out, uh, but for sure it, it's, it's not as commonly used now. Um, so, so, so just to wrap up on hydroxychloroquine, um, you know, the major problem was uh, that there seems to be, as I said, minimal clinical benefits and maybe uh, increased risk of uh, toxicity, mainly uh, QTC prolongation. Uh, we all know that there are potential drug-drug interactions. Um, not sure what is the clinical significance of it, but this is a drug which is uh, metabolized. Uh, half of the, you know, 50% uh, of the drug are unchanged in urine, but but the the, the other part is is metabolized. So, um, not sure exactly where is the the, the role of hydroxychloroquine. Um, of note, Cadiff is completing a review which is due very soon on the role of hydroxychloroquine in COVID. So. Uh, uh, stay in touch. Uh, about Kelitra, um, there was, I, I think that there's not much to say uh, other than uh, there was a, a group at McGill um, which has looked at the concentration of Kelitra in, in many patients and in, in, in a case series in 12 patients uh, who had COVID. Uh, and interestingly, they had a lot more uh, concentration, serum concentrations like three times higher than HIV positive patients, uh, but still um, not reaching the proposed concentrations uh, for um, COVID-19. There seem to be quite a lot of toxicity though, also, mostly um, gastrointestinal, some electrolytes and liver problems uh, in up to 42% of their uh, cohorts. So this is something to keep in mind. Um, so the, the Kelitra seems to be um, you know, maybe not doing much, despite the fact that there's a lot more drugs in, in, 
in, in COVID-19 patients as opposed to HIV positive patients. The great discovery was really the remdesivir who was showed to be um, essentially the first and only antiretroviral approved for COVID-19. Uh, what is remdesivir? It's an adenosine analog, a bit like BDI is for HIV. Um, and it works by, um, by stopping the prolongation, the chain uh, prolongation, the determination of the, 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 the chain prolongation at, at during transcription. Um, so there was one study, registrational studies, the ACTT1 uh, study that showed a faster recovery. So essentially patients on remdesivir um, had four days less than the standard of care uh, in terms of uh, clinical outcomes for recovery. Um, the subgroup of patients who seems to benefit the most were those that required oxygen, but uh, not on ventilation. And in these patients, there were six days different in, in the uh, recovery time. From a pharmacist's perspective or pharmacokinetic, interestingly, not much is known from this drug. There has been no formal drug-drug interaction studies performed. Um, what we know is that this drug is metabolized uh, mainly by esterases, but also uh, through different cytochrome P450 enzymes like the PCA, 2D6, and 3A4. Um, but we don't know really what is the significance of that. You know, we don't know how, what, what is the contribution of each of these metabolic pathways. Um, in the product monograph, it is recommended that strong inhibitors or inducers are not recommended. Also in terms of what this drug can do to other drugs, uh, what is very specific about uh, remdesivir is that it has a very short half-life. We're talking about one hour here. Um, so the likelihood of this drug to cause significant drug-drug interactions due to uh, uh, the impact it has on drug transporters or metabolic enzymes is much less. Um, it is an inhibitor of a transporter called OATP1B1, uh, which for those of you working in the hepatitis C world will uh, know that this is a significant interaction um, for these drugs. Uh, it interacts, for example, with statins, but um, again, given its very short half-life, the likelihood that this leads to clinically relevant drug-drug interaction is quite small. The other thing to keep in mind also is that there's a pharmacodynamic drug interaction, at least one that we believe that may be significant. Uh, it's theoretical drug-drug uh, interactions, but the chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine should not be used with remdesivir. And mainly it's because in vitro data demonstrated that there may be an antagonistic effect of, of these drugs on the activation of uh, remdesivir. Um, so again, that limits the kind of combination we can do with uh, the use of this medication. Remdesivir is, um, as uh, some other limitations, the drug cannot be co-administered in patients who has a uh, creatinine clearance less than 30 ml minutes. So it's known that in many patients uh, with COVID uh, being uh, admitted into uh, an ICU setting that they, uh, they tend to go on dialysis and have a decrease in their renal function. So this is something to keep in mind. And the reason for this is because there is a, um, uh, a cyclodextrin content. Uh, so this is a, a component which is added to the uh, uh, intravenous solution um, for uh, good absorb good uh, solubility of the medication. So essentially, this limits the use uh, of the uh, remdesivir use in patients with decreased renal function. The other news we've heard lately was the benefit of corticosteroids in the treatment of uh, COVID-19. So there's been a large randomized control trials looking at the use of dexamethasone at uh, doses of six milligram daily for 10 days uh, versus placebo. This is the recovery study uh, that was published in the, into the New England Journal of Medicine. In a nutshell, uh, this study showed a decrease in mortality um, by about uh, 36% uh, in the patients receiving um, invasive mecha mechanical ventilation. Um, so that was one of the first studies showing a, a, um, 
a benefit of a uh, medical treatment uh, on mortality. Uh, keep in mind that dexamethasone though is, is used again in patients uh, ventilated. So these are very uh, sick and acute, uh, very sick patients. From a uh, drug-drug interactions perspective, uh, all corticosteroids are known to, uh, to be somewhat an inducer, uh, to be inducers of uh, metabolic enzymes like the cytochrome uh, P453 or 4. Um, the significance of that is not necessarily well known. The, looking at reviews, we see that the magnitude of, of induction is, is in the range of 25% or so. Uh, this is a dose-dependent mechanism, and therefore, um, the significance of this drug interaction is, is probably not uh, very important given the dose used uh, in, in, um, in the COVID-19 patients um, and also the duration, which is short in time. Among other um, therapies we've been hearing lately is about the immunoglobulins or the uh, convalescent uh, plasma uh, therapy. Um, there's been a non-peer-reviewed publication that pooled um, the mortality of a different type of studies, uh, randomized control trial, match controls, and case series, that suggests that it may reduce the mortality by 50%. Again, I'm very careful about the significance of this uh, publication. Uh, this has been pulled from different quality uh, studies, um, which individually didn't show uh, significance, but when pulled together, show that there may be some, some impact. There's clearly uh, more research, which is ongoing. There's a concourse study, which uh, is, is underway here in Canada, um, which will hopefully uh, give us more uh, answers uh, on the benefit of this regimen on COVID-19 patients. Um, so, uh Thank you, Pierre, for that uh, summary of the, the key medications that we're looking at using on a day-to-day -day basis in practice. Obviously, there's many other medications. Colchicine got some attention, ribavirin did, but thus far, there's no compelling data to, to uh, suggest that we should be using these uh, in, in, our, in our patients. Just before we move on, one question about the dosing duration of remdesivir. Uh, Daryl, perhaps you uh, can uh, remind us about some of the literature telling us uh, the appropriate duration of dosing. Sure. So to my knowledge, there's been one uh, well-conducted trial that's been published in the New England Journal that randomized uh, hospitalized patients with COVID-19 to either receive a five or a 10-day course of remdesivir. And... Uh, although uh, there were some issues in terms of the randomization in that trial, not quite leading to perfectly balanced groups, the 10-day group by chance ended up a tiny bit uh, sicker at baseline uh, than the five-day, which would have uh, disadvantaged them a little bit. Overall, uh, the conclusion from the trial was still that a five-day course of therapy uh, didn't seem to be any different in terms of the ability to uh, result in some clinical improvement compared to the longer course. And that's a clinically important result because with a, with a brand new drug that obviously there are still some supply chain issues, um, it's uh, hard to acquire. If we can get away with giving um, patients a half the amount of drug and still uh, achieve the same result, that allows us to give the drug to potentially twice the number uh, of patients in need. And so I think it's a, a really clinically uh, relevant finding for that reason. Great, thanks, thanks Daryl. So um, lots of talk about the medications that we can offer people who are sick with COVID, uh, an equal amount of discussion about vaccines and all the, the potential good that, that, that those can do. Sherrick, um, can you bring us up to speed on what's happening on the vaccine front? Uh, thanks, Curtis. Uh, so as you said, there's obviously uh, lots of interest um, around the uh, vaccine development side. Uh, at present, there's almost, I think, around 40 potential vaccine candidates that are out there. Now, preface this by saying that they vary in terms of where they are in their development from phase one all the way to phase three. There are currently about six phase three trials uh, looking at vaccines for COVID-19. Um, I'm going to maybe just mention that they come in terms of the, the mechanisms. There are mRNA-based vaccines. There are subunit vaccines. There are vector-based vaccines that are out there. 
I think the two uh, maybe most promising ones is uh, one out of the University of Oxford that's collaborating with AstraZeneca. That particular vaccine is in its uh, phase three uh, enrollment. So hopefully we'll be seeing uh, some results um, in the near future. Uh, the other is out of a, a, a small biotech company in the United States that has an mRNA vaccine um, also in its, in its phase three. Um, I think what needs to be said about vaccines is that it is going to be only one of many solutions we're going to need. Um, I think the unanswered questions from vaccines are going to be its efficacy. And uh, that really, until we see some of the preliminary data come out, we're not going to know. I think uh, from the FDA's perspective, um, licensing of vaccines will require at least a 50% efficacy uh, in the general population. So that's sort of the bar that's being used. And if we use that as the bar, I think we'll all accept that that alone cannot be the only solution to be dealing with this pandemic. So this is just another tool um, in a very large, uh, you know, hopefully uh, alternate solutions uh, that are out there. Um, I also want to sidebar a little bit and mention another vaccine that people may have heard about, which is actually not a COVID-19 specific vaccine, but it's, a, it's the BCG vaccine. Now, for those that don't know the BCG vaccine, it's actually one of the oldest vaccines that we have out there. About, I think somewhere around 40 billion doses have been prescribed worldwide. And it's a vaccine that we use uh, to protect against the severe forms of tuberculosis. Uh, the vaccine itself uh, uses an attenuated form of Mycobacterium bovis. Now, this vaccine is implemented in many countries around the world. Um, in Canada, we, don't, we did not implement the BCG vaccine, but many countries in the developing and developed world context, in fact, did implement the BCG vaccine. And one important observation that came out of the countries that did implement the BCG vaccine was this concept of trained immunity. The idea that though BCG vaccine certainly did protect against the severe forms of tuberculosis when given to um, newborn children, uh, it seemed to have an effect uh, outside of that uh, to other respiratory infections, particularly respiratory viruses. Uh, there are a number of observational studies um, where BCG has been implemented that have supported this hypothesis. One I wanted to mention uh, is interesting because it's a study out of Spain. And Spain was interesting because different parts of Spain a different uptakes of the BCG vaccine. So they have a sort of a, a BCG control population and then the BCG implementation regions. And when they looked at these two groups in an observational manner, they found that there was a reduction in hospitalizations and respiratory infections by almost 40% in those people that implemented the BCG uh, vaccine. There are about 12, I think uh, roughly 12, maybe 13 studies currently underway globally looking at the idea of the BCG vaccine to protect healthcare workers. And again, the mechanism is that it stimulates your innate immune response. These are your neutrophils and macrophages that would um, help protect against viral infections, including COVID-19. Uh, I did want to mention that there is a recombinant BCG vaccine study uh, that is currently uh, underway in at least four different countries, one being Canada, so I think it deserves some mention. Uh, I'm, I'm actually a collaborator on that, a co-PI on that study that's looking at uh, first responders. So we're looking at uh, police officers, paramedics, and even healthcare workers. So just another, again, tool. It is certainly not going to be the only answer, but just another tool in the vaccine world of some interest. Good, thank you. Okay, um, you know, again, I think there's lots of, uh, lots of, uh, hope about the what vaccines will be able to do as far as addressing the COVID pandemic. But I think it's fair to say that we, we're all going to need to continue to implement social distancing, good hand hygiene, and the use of masks to protect uh, ourselves and, and those in our surroundings. And these very simple uh, things are, are going to be with us for, for a, a while yet. So we've talked about COVID in general. Um, now I'd like to turn our discussion so that it's focused uh, on people living with HIV, which is uh, uh, something that's on our minds uh, every day. So first question, and I'm gonna direct this to uh, Marissa. Um, and the question is, are people living with HIV, AIDS at more risk for infection, serious illness, and or death? Thanks, Curtis. And uh, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a, a really important question, I think, for, 
for many of us uh, working with uh, people at risk or living with HIV. And I think it's a question that everyone is, is trying to answer globally. I think we can approach it from a few different ways in terms of how to answer that. So, you know, from the, from the start of the pandemic, some of the groups that had been defined uh, at higher risk are those older or with other comorbidities. And, and HIV hadn't necessarily uh, sort of fallen into that sort of group or, or, or buckets or classification of those at higher risk. However, many of us were asking, what about our patients or people living with HIV that are more sort of profoundly immune compromised, um, what does their risk look like? And, and there have been a few studies that have come out that have uh, begun to try to answer that question. I think it's also important to remember that a lot of the measures that we put in place in terms of um, prevention and protection, many of which you just listed out, are are often um, more difficult for those individuals that are more vulnerable. And we certainly know that people at risk with HIV, many will fall into those groups or, or that we talk about as being more vulnerable in terms of populations or communities. So they might be of a lower socioeconomic position or, in, you know, or be more um, marginally housed and not necessarily have the same access to some of the prevention measures that are really important in terms of preventing acquisition with, with SARS-CoV-2. Um, in terms of those individuals living with HIV that do become infected or do acquire SARS-CoV-2, um, there, there was a recent publication that just came out out of uh, Rhode Island that had a, a small cohort of people living with HIV, I think it was 27 individuals, that had acquired um, the SARS-CoV-2 that were sick with COVID. And from what that um, uh, series showed is that those individuals had similar clinical syndromes and similar outcomes to those individuals without HIV. So I think I think we're still learning, and I think that there's lots that we need to be doing to protecting, to ensuring that um, people at risk or more vulnerable uh, have access to the important prevention measures, and that those that do have HIV and do acquire the virus that we're providing the, the best and appropriate care to them. Thanks. Daryl, from your review of the literature, um, is your impression that people living with HIV are about the same risk for infection and severe disease and mortality as, as uh, those without? Yeah, thanks for, for the question, Curtis. Um, I, um, I certainly agree this is a question that we get asked all the time. Uh, in the clinic uh, by, by patients, by other providers alike. And I, I would agree with the comments that Marissa has made that so far, although we don't have a tremendous amount of literature, uh, the answer to your question is, is, is yes, it seems to be similar uh, to, to what we've seen in other populations. Um, but I think that we have to temper that with an acknowledgement that we just don't have that much data yet. Uh, and uh, there are lots of reasons to think that, you know, the risk of, number one, uh, being exposed uh, to SARS-CoV-2 might not be the same for people who are living with HIV compared to the rest of the population for many of the reasons that Marissa just highlighted relating to so social vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, it's often been said that both of these viruses travel along fault lines in our societies, and, uh, and as a result, people are going to be disproportionately uh, at risk of exposure because of living in crowded conditions, being uh, a migrant uh, worker on a farm, uh, being incarcerated, being homeless. Uh, and, uh, and as a result of those being at greater risk. Um, in terms of the risk, like the biological uh, plausibility of there being a greater risk of infection if you are exposed or, or a greater risk of a bad outcome if you're infected, again, as Marissa said, uh, I agree there's, there's reason to suspect that that could uh, be the case. You know, it's, it's a virus that we're talking about. We know that HIV preferentially uh, leads to uh, a, a decrement in uh, T cell uh, immunity. We know the T cells are critical for, for, for uh, viral, uh, viral response. Um, so you could, could pause it that it would make sense that we might see that. Uh, we've also seen similar things in terms of other respiratory viral infections being maybe a little bit worse in the setting uh, of HIV. Influenza is a good example of that and, and part of the reason we recommend flu vaccination. And, and yet we, we haven't quite seen um, you know, a disproportionate number of people living with HIV who are coming down with the more fulminant manifestations uh, of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2 or, or of COVID-19 uh, disease. And, and we certainly don't particularly see um, a preponderance of, of people um, in our HIV clinics coming down with just the common colds that, uh, you know, a third of the time are caused by uh, coronaviruses. So reason to think that there might be uh, worse outcomes, but so far 
uh, we haven't seen that empirically. And, uh, and finally, you know, in addition uh, to, to the, the literature that Marissa just referenced, um, you know, there's a couple of, of groups who have tried to do systematic reviews already of this, and I, I, I am aware of a couple that were just published um, in the last uh, month or two. Um, still low numbers, you know, they're only looking at about, um, you know, a couple of dozen reports, some uh, in, in, in summary reporting on maybe 200 to 300 cases uh, in each uh, report. Um, overall, not showing data that suggests that uh, the manifestations are, are much, much different. Um, however, again, we don't have comparative studies, and that's really the, the gap. Uh, in order to properly answer this question, you know, does the same virus lead to different manifestations in people living with HIV compared to the general population? You'd really need to have a comparative cohort study. And unfortunately, uh, we cannot harness existing cohorts of people living with HIV to answer that question because uh, they won't have a comparative group, nor can we harness uh, general population cohorts uh, to look at this question because in general they're unlikely to have enough people with with HIV in them to to properly answer this question. So the jury I think is still out. Um, maybe the very last thing to say is that all of those comments that Marissa and I were both making I think are really about the direct impact of, of COVID-19 on the HIV epidemic and people living with HIV and AIDS. Uh, it, it kind of ignores another uh, dimension that we should be cognizant of which is that this virus and the pandemic have plenty of indirect impacts on people living with HIV. And you don't have to have COVID-19 infection uh, or, or SARS-CoV-2 infection oneself in order to uh, suffer adverse consequences. So uh, of course, we're all facing the social isolation, the psychological and mental health tolls of this, uh, but there's also very, very real uh, reports of serious disruptions in care um, for people living with HIV um, all around the world, um, no doubt there's there's some of that happening in Canada as well, but it's been particularly prominently uh, reported, I think, in uh, in parts of the global south where there are major disruptions to antiretroviral um, uh, supply chains for medication. Um, there's uh, redeployment to staff and overburdened health centers, which are making it difficult for people to, to obtain their routine HIV care. Um, and there's also, I think, in many cases, a fear of seeking care. I certainly see that in my own practice. People are, are afraid to come in. Um, and uh, unintentionally might be hindering or, or, or compromising certain elements of their own HIV care, which we know uh, is, is so critical. And, and many people have said that overall, this is easily going to amount to an undoing potentially of, of years, if not decades of progress that had uh, been made around the world uh, on, the, on the HIV epidemic. So lots of, uh, of reason to think there could be direct effects um, and, and lots of reason uh, to, to believe that there definitely are already uh, lots of indirect adverse consequences on people living with HIV. Thank you, Daryl, for your thoughts, and thanks for taking the discussion in that direction. Maybe to uh, continue on in, in that uh, in, in that uh, direction, Sherik, uh, what populations living with HIV in Canada are you particularly concerned about uh, at this time? Uh, thanks, Curtis. Um, and um, again, I'm going to follow up on some of the comments made by Daryl. Uh, I think when we look at the impact of COVID-19, I think it was very nicely outlined by him that we need to look at the direct or maybe indirect effects of COVID-19. So with that theme in mind, I think uh, the one thing we are clear about now that we're well into this pandemic is that clearly racial disparities um, have, are clearly a big player in this pandemic. Now, it's fair to say that a lot of that data is out of the U.S., but there's no reason why we wouldn't be able to extrapolate that U.S. experience to Canada. So I'm going to use the data out of New York City as an example. We can't think of a more cosmopolitan city uh, than New York City. Uh, and when you look at data coming out of New York City in their large outbreak that they've had of COVID-19, uh, it's clear that African-Americans followed by Hispanic or Latinos, uh, and then actually followed by Native Americans, um, disproportionately carried the, the burden of this pandemic. So much higher rates of hospitalizations, much higher rates of mortality, compared to the controlled white non-Hispanics uh, that live in the U.S. Uh, the same experience would certainly apply here. Now, questions could be asked, well, why? Why, why is that the case? And I know that both Marissa and Daryl have touched on this, but we can maybe expand on a bit further to say that I think the reasonings are probably driven by two factors. I think one could talk about living conditions playing a role. Um, certainly, um, uh, folks from racial minorities uh, often have multi-generational families, uh, that contributes to the rates of increased transmission and, and rates of infection 
Um, I think, again, just poor living conditions in general and uh, the socioeconomic impacts of that. Um, uh, food, uh, food insecurity has become really evident uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. There's a recent study completed again in actually Canadian data showing that uh, one in seven, seven Canadians, about 14% of Canadians have reported some sense of food insecurity, whether that's actually not having any food or being worried about their next meal uh, coming up. And we certainly know that uh, food insecurity impacts health, impacts immunity. And certainly, again, we can see how that can translate into higher concerns and risks of both acquiring the disease and developing complications from the disease. The other side actually would be, uh, the other main driving factors would be, uh, would be the, the health system access. And again, both Marissa and Daryl have touched on this, but there continues to be inequities when we talk about uh, access to healthcare. And yes, some of that may be driven by patient concerns about coming to our own institutions. I've seen that. I'm sure all of us have seen some of those concerns. They still exist uh, real um, uh, disparities. I think one example would be language barrier. Uh, that's still an issue out of many of our major cities. You know, language barrier can be a really important limitation for people to seek health care. Uh, so I think uh, those would certainly be the, the groups that we need to start paying much more attention to. It's the racial minorities. I did want to add one other study, and I mentioned that because this is a group that does not get mentioned in the U.S. data experience, um, but I think it's important to mention. It's actually data out of England and Wales. So again, when we think of England, uh, large uh, immigrant populations, lots of uh, racial ethnic diversity, and what they have shown out of fairly large uh, experiences in England and Wales that outside of, um, and they don't use the word African American, they use Black British, outside of Black British people, the second most common uh, population to be afflicted uh, by this particular pandemic actually was Pakistanis and people from Bangladesh, uh, which, by the way, we have many of uh, across Canada. Uh, and again, it would be really, again, the same ideas, uh, you know, multi-generational families living together, access to healthcare, language barriers. So I think those would be the, the, the groups that I would say that needs to remain our focus in Canada. And I, and I, I mentioned only uh, slightly, uh, well, I mentioned up front about the role of Native Americans. I think it's clearly important that we mention our Aboriginal population and our Native Canadians. Absolutely, there is data that's present within Canada that they are certainly seeing higher rates of infection, um, higher rates of complications. So again, within the Canadian context, that's where our resources uh, need to be driven. Good. Thank you for that thoughtful response, Sherrick. Um, when we see our, our patients in our clinics, uh, we're always concerned about the potential for drug-drug interactions. Here, I'm wondering if you can uh, briefly comment on any key drug-drug interactions that we should be aware of between some of the COVID medications and the antiretrovirals that uh, are, well, most of our patients are currently on. Thanks, Curtis. Um, Yes, yeah, so, so the, the safety of the COVID treatments with HIV is, is a little bit tough to elaborate because as uh, Theroux and Sherix has mentioned, we don't have a lot of reports about how well tolerated are the COVID treatment in the HIV specific patients. And, and, and as it was mentioned too, we have no comparator. Um, so the only thing we're, we have to rely on is how safe can we uh, predict these treatments will be uh, in HIV infected patients. Um, we've talked a little bit about the, 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 the Kelitra. Obviously, people going on Kelitra on the research protocols, and we have to follow uh, guidelines, especially in those patients that are already on protease and better based therapy. Uh, so so there, there's kind of decisions to be made uh, from that perspective. But from a drug drug, uh, if, if we focus more on, on, on dexamethasone and remdesivir, um, I, I think from a remdesivir perspective, it seems a pretty low risk for drug-drug interactions, uh, as I mentioned earlier, because of the short half-life of the drug. In terms of the dexamethasone, we know it's an inducer of cytochrome P453A4, which may have an impact on some of the antiretrovirals, uh, namely uh, some NNRTIs. Um, not so much about the integrase inhibitor, though, but we don't have any data to back us up about that. Again, what is reassuring is the short duration of these treatments, and, and, and we will hope that this is not going to be uh, leading to, a uh, to, to treatment failures, but uh, again, we need just more 
uh, experience and, and, and more uh, cohort data to guide us. The last thing I want to talk about is, uh, is maybe not about drug-drug interactions, but maybe about the pharmacodynamic of COVID and HIV. Um, we know, as I said earlier, that many of the COVID patients may go on renal failures, and we have to be careful with uh, some specific uh, risk of increased toxicity like uh, tenofovir inducing uh, nephrotoxicity because of decreased uh, GFR. So um, this again, um, bring us back to make, to make sure that the HIV patients with COVID uh, are being followed by a uh, multidisciplinary team, uh, having a pharmacist and, and, and physicians and intensivist essentially that will look into the, uh, the safe administration of these drugs. Um, and I will refer you to some of the good uh, reference uh, by the Liverpool group that has set up a website uh, that um, will make uh, assessments and, and evaluations of these drug-drug interactions. Great, thank you. Now at our last webinar, uh, we all indicated that we had very rapidly transitioned into assessing a large proportion of our uh, population to teleclinic type of uh, follow-up. Daryl, um, are you still doing this? And um, are, is this meeting the needs of our patients living with HIV? Um, and importantly, are there uh, individuals or, or populations that are, that are falling through the cracks because of our reliance on telemedicine uh, formats these days? Thanks for asking that question, Curtis. I think it's really important for us to be thinking uh, about the impact that COVID has had on how we deliver care because it's led to a lot of rapid innovations, I think, and, and adaptations. But uh, although those have largely been born out of necessity, I think some have admittedly had some unintended consequences while others may have uh, led to things that we might want to, to hang on to. So certainly I agree with you that uh, virtually all the clinical settings that I'm aware of, including the, own, uh, the ones in which I, I myself practice in, uh, very quickly uh, back in, in March pivoted to uh, remote models of care. So there have been telemedicine or telehealth infrastructures uh, that have already existed in many of our jurisdictions that uh, have been have been utilized. Now, many of those, I think, quickly became overwhelmed uh, at the, with the initial rush back, back in March. So we also relied back on the, the, the basic uh, technology of the telephone. Uh, and I myself continue to provide a, a large majority, I would say, of my outpatient care through the telephone still at this point. Um, and, and that certainly has advantages. It's, it's convenient to be able to, to do that, I think, uh, without having to, to travel back and forth for, for, for patients uh, and for clinicians to some extent. Uh, but there have been some downsides. So sometimes, of course, uh, you really do need to have a video encounter, which you can't do uh, by telephone. You can't thoroughly assess uh, things, of course, uh, remotely all of the time. Uh, and uh, I think another uh, advantage uh, to in-person care, of course, is that for many of our more marginalized populations or patients, uh, they have often arrived in the clinic in, in pre-COVID time with a support worker, with a care worker who's there to, to help uh, guide them through their, their care trajectory, to help advocate for them. And the challenges in trying to do that through a remote medium, it's not impossible to do. We've done it before, but it certainly is more challenging. and It's certainly happening, I think, less frequently than we would like. Um, uh, other examples of how we've, we've modified things um, for, for, for good and for um, unintended consequences uh, coming out of them as well, you know, everyone still um, does try to get laboratory monitoring done as, as best as possible. And so we're simply mailing requisitions. Uh, we finally, in many settings, moved to uh, more routinely using email as a, as a medium. And in that sense, catching up with the 21st century uh, to, to get requisitions to patients quickly, for example, uh, with the appropriate privacy measures uh, in place. Uh, but this, in turn, has led to some challenges as well. Uh, whereby, for example, myself, when I provide care for folks in whom I want to include screening for bacterial sexually transmitted infections, where we would routinely typically collect a throat swab and a rectal swab, many of the labs to whom we have our patients uh, go for, uh, for, for lab testing, uh, that's, that's different from where they would normally come in, in our clinics, for example, are not accustomed to doing that testing. They're, they're, they simply don't know how to do it properly. They're, they're not used to the concept of patients doing their own testing. They're not used to that sense of, of patient empowerment. This could be 
uh, turned into an advantage if we're able to harness this opportunity to kind of train those facilities up. But I think it is a lot of, uh, a lot of change that we would be asking for. Um, other examples of, of, of ways in which I think the health system has tried to adapt um, out of necessity uh, and, and ultimately with patients' best interests in, at heart, although it may not feel like it, um, are at the level of, of dispensing pharmacies. So uh, I, I know a lot of, I learned from my own patients actually that uh, many, many pharmacies were switching to a model whereby they would only dispense one month of medications at a time, whether it's for their antiretroviral therapy, whether it's for, for pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, medications or what have you. Uh, and they were doing that because they wanted to ensure they had adequate supply for everyone. So they were worried about supply chains very, very uh, understandably. The unintended consequence of this concern, of course, is that it inconveniences people. People now have to go to the pharmacy multiple times, three times per quarter rather than once uh, per quarter that they were used to. Um, and of course, uh, you know, that's, that's an inconvenience uh, and potential uh, risk that, that we didn't uh, want to have happen. We are starting to move back towards uh, more and more in-person care. And uh, again, to, to speak right, right to your question, Curtis, um, a lot of this is really dictated by the institutions uh, themselves for, for which or in which we, we practice. So uh, private practitioners may be able to make their own decisions about, about how quickly they'd like to ramp up. Uh, but some of our larger academic hospitals have dictated what proportion of our visits we're allowed uh, or encouraged to do in person. Uh, they're, they're doing that, of course, because we want to in, ensure we can continue to do adequate screening at the door, ensure adequate physical distancing in the waiting rooms, uh, et cetera. And so we've been forced to prioritize uh, who amongst our, our booked patients have issues that are most pressing in a way or, or most uh, essential to provide in person. Um, and, and hopefully this, this serves everybody's needs appropriately. But once again, I'll point out that there's a little bit of irony there. One of the populations that, of course, we would intuitively feel that we should prioritize for that kind of in-person visit would be, for example, folks who seem to have evidence of virologic failure on their antiretroviral regimen. But in fact, the very reasons that I think many of my own patients might be struggling to uh, have a suppressed viral load, to uh, maintain fully adherent with their therapy, may in turn be the very same types of social marginalizing factors that might make it that much more challenging for them to make it to the clinic for an in-person visit where I want to try to work with them closely to address those issues. So I think there's a lot of complexities uh, tied up in, in how we've tried to adapt uh, and how we've tried to innovate. I hope that some of the innovations are things that uh, we could uh, use even uh, in that distant future day when, when things are kind of more back to normal, in quotation marks, uh, such as uh, a judicious use of, of telephone visits, which are more efficient for folks who are really doing well and we just want to do a quick check-in, uh, things like the uh, encouraging uh, labs to get more used to providing specimens for self-testing of, of bacterial STIs is another example. Um, but I think uh, there are uh, many challenges along the way that we'll continue to need to, uh, to address creatively. Good. Thank you, Daryl. It really will be interesting to see how this all unfolds in the future to see which of these innovations in our provision of HIV care remain in which uh, and in which areas will we return back to the way we, we used to do this. So we'll rely on our own experience and we'll rely on the feedback coming from our patients who ultimately will tell us the best way to go. Um, we're nearing the end of our session. Just wanted to uh, touch briefly on the efforts that are occurring nationwide by uh, many clinician researchers um, on the research front, many people who have, have dedicated their, their lives to research have, have turned their attention to COVID uh, in people living with HIV and in, in the general population as well. Um, Daryl, I know, is leading a very exciting uh, Kaletra prophylaxis study. Uh, which is now recruiting. So congratulations on, on that. And uh, uh, it's addressing a very important unanswered question about the role of, of this medication in the uh, protection of people who've been exposed to, to, um, to uh, COVID. Um, many other investigators working on new compounds, working in the vaccine field, looking at the social science and mental health aspects of this. Um, so uh, we look forward to uh, 
sharing some of the outcomes from this uh, on future CAR uh, webinars and other symposia. So with that, I'd like to thank the panelists for their uh, for sharing their wisdom uh, this afternoon. Um, I look forward to uh, discussing uh, questions uh, in the next couple of minutes. I would like to uh, thank the people at Sea to Sky and in the CAR office for their hard work in putting this all together, and in particular to Aaron Love uh, from the CAR office. And uh, again, I'd like to acknowledge Gilead for their uh, unrestricted support uh, of this uh, webinar. So with that, I uh, thank the audience for joining us today and uh, look forward to uh, considering the questions uh, coming from many of you today. Bye for now.